Hello, welcome to Free Bible Commentary with Pastor Teacher Dr. Bob Utley. Be sure to visit Free Bible Commentary at www.freebiblecommentary.org. Now, here's Bob. This chapter of Deuteronomy. Uh, this is still the section of Deuteronomy that deals with assorted laws, and uh, not sorted, assorted. And uh, again, it's very unrelated, and it's going to deal with some very some things you've heard about a lot, dealing with the Leverite marriage, uh, dealing with corporal punishment in Israel, uh, those kinds of things. So I think tonight I would like for you to read through this in your own translation, and then we'll come back and discuss it verse by verse. That'll give you a head start, and you can, we can pick up when we go through it. Notice verses 1 through uh, 3 is talking about corporal punishment in Israel. Um, the reason there's not a whole lot dealt with about corporal punishment with nomadic tribes, usually anything that's worth going to court over is the death penalty. Now, that stops a lot of your criminal problems. <laughs> that deals away with the court system and the penal system and the probation system. So most of the crimes that, you, that were worthy enough to be dealt with were the death penalty. Now, that was not always the case, and so this little section on corporal punishment is mentioned here. Verse 1 relates back to Deuteronomy 17, verses 8 and following, that deal with the procedure of the court, that the priest shall be a part, and uh, the judges, there shall be a central court in the central sanctuary and local courts at the gates involving the elders, and this is kind of the court system of Israel. Uh, notice... One of the discussion questions is, why is verse 1 so important to theology? As you read verse 1, does anything strike you as phenomenally significant? If it does, it would surprise me. Um, it doesn't seem to say anything really significant. But it does. And the area that it does is the connotation of the Hebrew word to justify or to make righteous. This is one of the classic examples of the word that means so much to us, justification. This is the Old Testament basis for the forensic sense of the word justify. Now, forensic is just a word for legal, and the Hebrew here says uh, that you shall, the righteous one, declare righteous. And so we have... These two words used in a judicial sense where the elders declare someone uh, righteous. Now, this is exactly uh, along the lines of what God does for us in Jesus Christ. The Bible never says that sin is not important. It never says it's not significant. It never says God takes it lightly. But it does say that God has paid a very high price for man's sin. But because of the price, that Jesus Christ paid, man is justified. Now, he's guilty, but he's judicially acquitted because someone else has paid the price. Now, this is the Old Testament foundation verse for that understanding of the legal sense of justify. Now, we have a problem in English because we have several w words that we use. We use the word justify, we use the word righteous, we use the word just, we, just, we use the word right. In Hebrew, all of these words come from the same root. Justification, uh, righteousness, all that come from the same root. And it's a root that means a standard or a rule or a straight edge, so to speak. Now, where do you think that came from, this idea of a straight edge as being the Old Testament word for righteousness or justification or that kind of thing? Well, I've told you many times, but I'm not sure it always sinks in the implications of these word definitions. The Hebrew words for sin are words that mean to be crooked, to miss the mark, fall short, to be perverse. All of them speak of the deviation from a standard. Well, here is a beautiful picture that to be right with God is to meet the standard of God, which 
uh, we learn from the New Testament is not just a series of rules, but the righteousness of God himself. That's why that very difficult verse, you are to be holy, for I, the Lord your God, am holy. That's the standard of righteousness, God himself. And that's why the Bible can clearly say that all we like sheep have gone astray, and every one has gone unto his own way, and none of us has sought after God. The New Testament way is all have sinned and come short of the, we could put, standard of God's holiness there. So this is very important for this understanding of this Hebrew word for justification or righteousness, okay? Uh, notice verse 2, if you would, please. And then it shall be, if the wicked man deserves to be beat, the judge shall make him lie, lie down and be beaten in his presence with a number of strikes according to his guilt. Now, there's several things here very important. Number one, the judge has got to be present. Now, it doesn't, the context here is not real sure whether the judge is to be the observer or the beater, the one who inflicts the punishment. Later, Judaism required the presence of three people. The one that did the beating, the convicting judge that read scripture during the time, and another person to count the number of strikes. Uh, Judaism is a bit, um, it's very humanitarian in some ways, in other ways it's not. A man was taken to the place where he was to be beaten. Uh, the judge was to rip his clothes off his back. His hands were to be tied to a low post, a real low post. His hands would be tied like that. A, the, the one to inflict the blows would be to stand on a rock that was very close to get maximum leverage, and he was to strike with all his force. Later on, uh, the Talmud, the Jews said, find someone who's strong of mind and weak of body to give the blows. <laughs> they didn't want to find the strongest man in town to beat you up. They just wanted to, wanted, they, it was important to them that the, this, this punishment be given. Notice where it says, lie down. Now, to, to lie down and be beaten in the presence. Now, the Hebrew here is before the face of. And uh, one of my favorite Jewish commentators, Rashi, and following the rabbis before him and after him say that, that in the face of means that the man is to be tied, first of all, with his face up, and that one-third of the number of blows is to be given on the chest, and two-thirds of the blows are to be given on the back. Now, we don't know exactly what kind of instrument was used. In Exodus 21.20, a rod was used to beat the slaves, and it seems probable that the rod was used in these kind of beatings, too. Later on in Judaism, a whip was used made of oxen hide that was very wide and tied in a knot. And so whether it's talking about an oxen hide whip or a rod, we just can't be too sure. Notice what it says, the number of stripes according to his guilt. Notice that Hebrew justice was based on the, the premise that the punishment should fit the crime. Peggy and I have talked about that son as parents. I don't know about you. Uh, when my little girl sticks her tongue at me and says, I won't do it, nanny nan, and you can't make me friends, it's almost like she walked in the street. <laughs> it's hard to it's hard to let that be a mild transgression. I, it really makes me mad sometimes the way they the way they go through stages of just defying you. But we have to continue to remember that if we blow up on things like that, what are we going to do about the very severe things that are damaging to their health? We've we've got to fit punishment to the crime which is not always easy to do, but the Jews were saying that the number of, number of stripes was commensurate with the, with the guilt that a man had. So it may vary from any number of stripes up to a maximum of how many? Well, the next verse says 40. Now, by Paul's day, it came to be 39 because they did not want to break the law. There's another, another way the Jews tried to keep from ever breaking God's law. They just, they just beat somebody 39 times. Paul says in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 24, that he was beaten this way five different times with 39 stripes. Friend, this, this is not, not in your Sunday school wrestling match. Uh, these were brutal beatings, and Paul went through five of them. Can you imagine what Paul's back must have looked like? Uh, now, notice the, the humanitarian nature of Deuteronomy comes in here even in the midst of this when it says, He may, may beat him forty times, but no more, lest he beat him with many more stripes than these, and your brother be degraded in your eyes. Even in the midst of a criminal act, the man was to be treated as what? Your brother. 
And he was not to be beaten more than 39 times because beating more than that would make him on the level of an animal. And he is your brother. So uh, there is a humanitarian spirit for the one that's being punished, that he be brought back into the community after his punishment, which I think needs to be said in our penal system today. One real problem with our penal system is we think once a thief, always a thief, or once an, uh, uh, a felon, always a felon, or once a crook, always a crook, and we don't give those men chances they come back in society. No wonder that our penal system is so uh, counterproductive because they are not re-accepted and can't find usually meaningful employment. So I think we ought to take a word from the Jewish law court and consider them back among us. Verse 4 it's just thrown right in the middle of this thing. You shall not muzzle the ox while he is threshing. Now, there's uh, several things that can be said about this. Number one, again, it's the humanitarian nature toward animals. Uh, this is found also in chapter 22, verses 6 and 7, about a bird's nest on the ground, isn't it? It's also found in Proverbs chapter 12, verse 10, where it says, A righteous man has regard for the life of his beast, but the compassion of the wicked is cruel. Uh, there again, God says a word about what he thinks about animals and kindness to them. The ox, or the, the heifer that did this uh, threshing, either walked on the grain uh, with his or her feet and separated the, the fruit or the grain from the shaft or the husk or the cob, or they pulled a little thing called a threshing uh, block, and it was just a wedge-shaped piece of uh, maybe rock that, that squashed the grain out. This is a very easy job for animals, and a lot of the rabbis said it, it's so easy we shouldn't feed them all the time. This is exactly, Paul picks up on this and says, this is the Old Testament proof text for paying the preacher. <laughs> Thank you, Paul. 1 Corinthians 9.9, 9, 1 Timothy 5.18. Uh, I like to be compared to an ox, I guess. <laughs> anyway, it's, it's used by him in that way. Uh, this is a, just in a passing, this is a Jewish principle of interpretation. They would say, since God thought enough to take time to, to talk about the oxen being fed, and Paul would say, isn't God more concerned with you than oxen? Therefore, it's moving from a minor premise to a major premise, and that's why uh, sometimes we get so goofed up uh, trying to follow Jewish exegesis because they don't go just verse by verse, but they go from minor premise to major premise and that kind of stuff. That's what Paul was doing, was using rabbinical hermeneutics when he, he wrote these examples in the New Testament. Now, notice if you would, um, verse 5 down through verse 10 deals with Leverite marriage. Now, the word Leverite, most of my Bible studying life, I thought Leverite was related to Levites. Have you, how many thought that? You know, yeah, I did too. I, you know, it was just so close that I never dreamed it was different. But the word lever is the Latin word for brother-in-law. The word leverite marriage never appears in the Bible. Leverite marriage is a name that we stuck on it after the Latin Vulgate Bible came out. It's brother-in-law marriage is what it really is. It has nothing to do with Levites whatsoever. Notice where there, there's some stipulations here in verse 5 and the why and the wherefores of this. So it says, when brothers live together, this is talking about the uh, sociological term, the extended families where more than one generation lived, either in one household or on one uh, homestead. And so two brothers live together, one of them dies and has no son, the wife of the deceased shall, be, shall not be, uh, now notice the word married in my translation is italicized, which means it's not in the original, outside the family, which is italicized, to a strange man. Now, the strange man is not a non-Hebrew. The strange man is simply a man not in the extended family unit. It's just that she will not be married in another family. You say, why? Why? Because of the inheritance. So vitally important to the Jews, the inheritance. So she is to, she is to stay in the family, and here's how. Her husband's brother shall go into her and take her to himself as wife and perform the duty of a husband's brother to her. And it shall be the firstborn. Now, we have to realize the firstborn here is the firstborn what? Son. And uh, if you want to look at the place of daughters in this system, Numbers 27, verses 6 through 11 deal with uh, another aspect of this. If there is no son, the daughters may inherit. 
The book of Job, I think, is very beautiful in this, that Job let his daughters inherit equally with his sons. But those were the exceptions and not the rule. Usually the daughters did not inherit at all. Now, see what it says? Uh, the, the first son shall bear, assume the name of the dead brother, that his name may not be blotted out in Israel. Now, his name may not be blotted out in Israel is a way of showing the common view of the afterlife in the Old Testament. Now, I think the Old Testament has some glimpses of resurrection. I think Daniel 12. I think some of the Psalms of David. I think parts of the book of Job. But, friends, those are extremely rare. The common accepted view in the Old Testament was that a man lived on in his children in a meaningful way, although he existed in a shadowy, uh, unhappy existence in Sheol. And so to cut a man's name out from the land of the living was to destroy all hope in a meaningful afterlife. Now, of course, we know from the New Testament that that was certainly corrected in time. And that was, in my opinion, a false theology of the Old Testament, as there are many things the New Testament corrected and reinterpreted, or put it better, interpreted in the true light. Now, notice verse 7, where it talks about, if a man does not desire to take his brother's wife, then the brother's wife shall go to the gate to the elders and say, my husband's brother refuses to establish a name for his brother in Israel, and he is not willing to perform the duty of a husband's brother to me. Now, notice, please, I think what's happening here uh, is the man wants the property of his brother. If he does not marry this woman and does not raise up a son, then the property belongs to him. The implication being greed possibly might be involved, although there may be some other reasons too, but greed is one possible option here. I want you to, to notice with me something. I wish you would circle this in your Bible. In verse 7, there's three different verbs to describe the, the brother-in-law refusing to marry his sister-in-law. The word, even in English it keeps this, does not desire, refuse, and is not willing. Now, Old Testament critical scholarship has gone to the Old Testament, and every time they, they found a different name for something or a different verb used for something, they say, oh, this belongs to one author and this belongs to another author, and they cut the opening chapters of Genesis up, and they cut the Pentateuch into four sources of different times and different peoples. But they are not consistent, for every one of them says that this belongs to D, of the Deuteronomic author. But here again is a variety of language, a variety of verb forms. And if they're going to be consistent with their presuppositions, they've got to divide this up into separate authors too. This is an example of the variety within the language of, of uh, Semitic origins, which says to me that there are not many authors of the Pentateuch, but, man, after the Bible says over and over, God said to Moses, God said to Moses, God said to Moses, man, you kind of think God said something to Moses. So uh, just note that this is one example that I, in my opinion, just destroys this whole theory of J-E-D-P source criticism of the Old Testament. Boy, it burns me what they do to the Bible. Dead them. Now, in verse 8, Notice where it says, Then the elders of the city shall summon him and speak to him. Now, the Talmud says, if the elders get, get one of these people together, if the boy is real young, say he is a very young brother, real young, and if there's a great age difference between the lady who's requesting this and the young brother, the rabbis will say, Don't do it, son. Go ahead and let her take your shoe off and spit at you. <laughs> um, the Jews are very important about getting the right, the right people married. They just really emphasize marrying the right person. And so this developed later on. It was, here it looks like they're going to say, do it, do it, do it. But as it developed, they would sometimes counsel against it, saying, don't do it. So I thought that was interesting. Now, notice if you would in verse 9 where it says, and here's the public shame of this deal. And the brother's wife shall come to him in the sight of the elders. And of course, the, the, the word gate in verse 7 means the local court, and the elders are the ones who perform that duty in the local sense. And in front of everybody, in the sight of the elders, and pull off his sandal from his foot and spit in his face. Oh, terrific. Now, this is not quite what we do in America about a public notice, but it's the same thing behind it. The idea about pulling off a sandal is very, very interesting. We learn from the book of Ruth that something like this was done between Boaz and the next of kin to marry Ruth. But Ruth is different because the Boaz is not the brother-in-law, but he is a near relative. He's not called 
the brother-in-law. He's called a goel, which is a Hebrew word for redeemed. Uh, so it's a different setting. Just as Genesis 38 between Tamar and Judah is a different setting, but involved in the same kind of tradition about a brother-in-law. Uh, taking the sandal off is a symbol of transfer of ownership in a sense. Uh, the feet and, and the shoes are, are very communicative and very symbolic in the Hebrew language. And I don't think we realize in English because we, we don't think about feet as being beautiful or feet as being uh, communicative. Has it ever bothered you about the little verse that says, uh, beautiful are the, uh, are the feet of those who bear the gospel? That's a strange way to say that, isn't it? Beautiful are the feet of those who bear the gospel. Um, to the Hebrews, they always wore some kind of, of shoes, except when they went into their home, when they went into worship, uh, or if they were just, you know, going real close around the house. Several times in the Bible it says, take the shoes off your feet, holy ground, Moses the burning bush. Uh, the priests are never mentioned as having shoes. It talks about every detail, their clothing, but no shoes. Apparently, the priest ministered in the tabernacle barefooted. That's a lot of blood to step on, wasn't it? Flies and stuff. Well, the feet also, uh, Hebrew would, would speak with their feet. We know if they, a, a kick or a gesture would mean, would communicate more animosity or greed or friendliness than we ever would with our feet. Uh, I've told you before, and now you need to look it up. Many times the feet is a euphemism in the Old Testament for the male sex organs. Is I, I meant to say, see how what a wide variety these words can mean? You just get your concordance, look up the word feet, and follow the references, and see what a wide connotation of meaning this idea of feet or sandals has to a Hebraic community. So it was very important. A little bit later, this guy down in verse 10 is going to be called the house of him whose sandal is removed. A great a name of reproach on this man. Well, she takes his shoe off and spits in his face. Well, the rabbi said, no, no, spits before his face. <laughs> I got tired of getting spit in the face, I guess. Uh, but this is an Old Testament sign of contempt or sorrow. Uh, it's done numerous times in the Old Testament. It was done by the Jewish leaders to Jesus. It's just a common way of showing contempt. Now, uh, okay, let's look at verse 11 and 12. Uh, as you can imagine, this is a pretty severe verse. Um, you got a fight between two men. The wife comes out and breaks the fight up. This is the only, uh, most of these laws are unique to this chapter of Deuteronomy. This is extremely unique because it's the only mention in all the Bible of mutilation as punishment. Now, the code of Hammurabi and the other law codes that we know about from archaeology uh, have many accounts of mutilation as an example. But this is the only account, really, in the, in the Hebrew legislation. The rabbis got very nervous about it. They said, don't cut her hand off. Make her pay restitution. So it seemed too severe to them. And yet, why do you think the penalty is so severe for something like this? Why would it be so severe? Inheritance. Inheritance. What if she incapacitated that man from having children? That man's name would be cut off from Israel. So she was almost committing murder. Now, uh, I want to add this other thought. It may be this is one specific example uh, of a wider kind. I'm not, I just can't believe this happened all the time. Uh, I can see some fights maybe, but this just doesn't seem to be a common occurrence in Israel. I don't, I don't, we'd break a fight up, I bet you, but, uh, so I think it's talking about one example of kind of how to deal with problems like this. <laughs> and beyond that, you can, you can interpret it for yourself. Uh, beginning in verse 13, we have an idea about just weights and measures. In verse 13, it says, You shall not have in your bag different weights. Now, the he Hebrew here is a stone and a stone. Now, it's not the idea of a pound weight and an ounce weight. It's the idea of the guy who comes to buy grain. And when he buy buys grain, he uses a one rock to buy grain with. But when he turns around to sell the grain, he gets a little bit smaller rock. And he's cheating. 
he's buying it at a cheaper price than he's selling it. And so it's the idea of having two weights for the same thing. Now, this is mentioned all through the Old Testament. It's a, a parallel passage is Leviticus 19, 35 and 36, but also over in the book of Proverbs it mentions this again. Uh, the first one is found in chapter 11, verse 1, where it says, A false balance is an abomination to the Lord, but a just weight is his delight. And then in Proverbs chapter 16, verse 11, this very same thing is mentioned again because it is so very important. A just balance and scales belongs to the Lord. All the stones of the bag are his concern. Now that says something me I think is very important. It says, we try in our society to break up a man's business life from a man's religious life. You ever heard somebody say, now this is business. Friend, there's no such thing as this is business with Jesus people. Everything God's involved with, every aspect of your life he's involved with. And just because we pigeonhole life in different segments, just remember, that's what we do. That's not what God does. God's involved with everything that we're involved in. And so I think it says that about merchants. Now, um, notice that verse 15, very interesting. It says, uh, this thing about full weight and full measure, that your days may be prolonged in a land which the Lord your God gives you. Now, I've heard many sermons on that the fact that honor your father and your mother is the is a individual promise of longevity. If you're and now first we got to define what honor your father and your mother means in that context, which is not always easy. But beyond that, if you show respect to your father and your mother, God promises you a long life. Now that is not the case at all. And all you have to do is look how this phrase is used through the book of Deuteronomy. We found it used, I think, three or four times so far. And every case has been different. This is not a, a promise to an individual. This is a promise to a society. A society that honors their father and their mother. A society that has fair uh, uh, commercial practices. It's a society that will last long, you see. So this is a society promise, not an individual promise. And just look how this phrase is used through the book of Deuteronomy, and I think it will be obvious to you. Notice in verse 16, is a summary verse, but notice how important it is. For everyone who does these things, everyone who acts unjustly is an abomination to your God. God has an attitude that seeks fairness, justice, equality. And any area of your life that you know in your heart is unfair, and you do it anyway, is unpleasing to our God. May I mention one area that I think is important? And that's income taxes. No, it is not all right to cheat on income taxes. No, the government does not have all the money it needs, and it's spending your money you don't like it. The Bible says that we must honor governmental authorities. We are not to cheat them because we don't like them. We are to be fair and above board in every area of our life, bar none. God hates the person who knows he's acting unjustly and acts anyway. Think about that. Verse 17 through 19 is, I think, a very significant uh, passage about uh, Amalek, but it seems to be out of place. I don't know what it's doing here, but this whole thing hadn't been very connected, so it doesn't bother me. I don't think it's, it's misplaced as far as the text. It just seems to be misplaced as far as the context. Now, who is Amalek? I keep on calling him Elimelech, but it's Amalek. First of all, he is the grandson of who? You remember? Esau, grandson of Esau, father Eliphaz. You find that from Genesis 36, 15 and 16. So you, could you tell why he might have a little animosity between him and Jacob's children? Now he is a nomadic desert tribe living south of the Dead Sea. Uh, the Ishmaelites lived in the same area. These people bothered the Israelites from the beginning all the way up through the time of Hezekiah. And uh, 
This account here goes back to Exodus 17, 8 through 16, where they, these uh, Amalekites attacked the children of Israel at Rephidim. Now, we learn from this text that what they did was they let the children of Israel move out, and all the old and sick and weak and stragglers they attacked. And they killed many of God's people that were unable to keep up with the regular caravan. And boy, it burnt Moses. This is the account where Moses stood on the rock and, and uh, Aaron and Hur held his arms up. And while they did, Joshua won. And when he let his arms got tired, Joshua was defeated. That's this account right there. Now, we find them again in the book of Judges, chapter 3, verse 13, as raiding Israel with camels. These were uh, camel bandits. <laughs> We find them in the, in the time of Saul in 1 Samuel 15, 2, as Saul had to fight them. We find them in the time of David, 1 Samuel 27, 8, when David had to fight them, and they were always a thorn in Israel's side. And uh, the reason that God is so down on them is they did not fear God or reverence God. And so he, he says, you shall blot their memory out from among you. Now, what does that mean? What, what would you think that meant? Blot their memory out. That means kill them all. Men, women, children, everything. Uh, sounds pretty harsh to us, but it was a characteristic of the day in which it was done. Comments? Questions? Yes, Becky? Let's turn the lights down, window, a little bit for me. Oh, it seems to be because of, of uh, Genesis 38 in the book of Ruth that either a near kin or the father-in-law took over the responsibilities. Now, you see, I, we need to realize what exactly is happening here. Is this a sexual thing? No. This is an inheritance thing. And uh, it was very important to them to keep the family possessions in the family. So this is not a... Uh, this is not an accommodation to evil or lusting or something. This is strictly practical. <laughs> Keep that girl's dowry in the house, <laughs> you know. And uh, that's, that was what it was done. So someone, some close kin was, was to, to do that duty. Yes, Rod? No. No, if she had a son, that son inherited her name, and I'm, I assume she could remarry, and they wouldn't really care where she remarried as long as she had a son that would inherit. Winston? Yeah. Right. Uh, yeah, that, that was very communicative for those. The Jews used to do that when the, if the Jews would have to walk through Samaria, you know. When they got to the border of Judah, they'd take their sounds off and knock all the dust of Samaria off so they wouldn't pollute the land. <laughs> Dorothy? Isn't that something? See, I, I would never pick that up. It had to be a cultural thing. If somebody showed me the sole of their foot, I'd say, Neolite, huh? <laughs> you know, wouldn't mean nothing. But we do certain things that, that they would not understand. They really would. I remember, uh, I thought it was unusual that some of the gestures that we have, English gestures, that we, some of the gestures we make with our hands, 
the prisoners of war in Vietnam, when they were being forced to do, to sign these treaties and all, saying they were guilty and all, they would make certain gestures that the Viet Cong did not understand, but communicated quite drastically back home to show they were doing something they did not want to do. Remember those pictures? And when the Viet Cong found out about what they were doing, they really got very rough treatment for that. There was a way, it only communicated to us because we're in a culture that that was a same thing with these, these feet and shoes deal. Sure was. Yes, Donna. Yes. Well, it was, if there was no son, they would inherit. And in families like Job, that was a very close family, the father said, I want the daughters to inherit equally. But as the common norm, no, they didn't. For you can tell it here from this passage on Leverite marriage, the wife was considered part of the property. So she didn't have much rights. David? That's right. That's right. <laughs> you better explain that, I want to tell you. <laughs> Turn off the tape. Thank you, David. I was afraid it was going to be a physical comparison. <laughs> yeah, it's a, you know, I, if y'all want an interesting study, you ought to, you ought to follow the, the symbol of the bull or ox through Scripture. You know, that golden calf was not idolatry in the sense of another god. That golden calf was supposed to be a symbol of Yahweh. Matter of fact, that symbolism is even kept in Solomon's temple. Remember what the laver set on? It set on four bulls facing each direction. The, the uh, cherubim have what? No, seraphim have one of their faces the face of an ox or a bull. And uh, so there is some very interesting symbolism of, of the bull through the Bible. That could be misunderstood, couldn't it? <laughs>